One of the new members in less than a year, of course, in the Big 12 will be Houston, but they have another year left in the American Conference where they have been right there at the top and competing for it is uh, Houston. And we're now joined by Joseph Duarte, Houston Chronicle, covers the Cougars and many things as well. Joseph, thank you very much for your time. Uh, your, your thoughts about Holgerson, this team, the early schedule, which, of course, there are some landmines if they're not careful. And, and what's the mindset right now? Well, you know, there's there's a lot on their mind right now, uh, namely, you know, year four under Dana Holgerson. This is set up to be uh, potentially the best season they've had. And that says a lot. They're coming off of a 12-win season, but they think they can be even better this season. And, of course, that all leads up to sort of hopefully them catapulting into the Big 12 next season. But, uh, you know, based off of, of everything that's gone on with the with the school and the program, you know, this is the, the most excitement that's been around us since the Tom Herman days of, of 2015. So it's been a while for them. Uh, but Dana Hogerson feels like now he's got the pieces in place and and some some backups behind it that that if they you know avoid injuries and like you said one of those early landmines uh, on the road against Texas San Antonio or uh, Texas Tech, you know they could be the Cincinnati uh, of this season. Joseph, uh, the number 24 ranking I saw, you know, in the polls, everybody comes out and has their, their thoughts on how the polls, uh, you know, work and everything like that. The coaches, uh, not as high on Hughes. I guess it's about the same, 24-25 in the polls. Do you think that's about right for them, given that they are a really good team that maybe a lot of people still don't quite know that yet? And when you look at their schedule, you do see those landmines early on, so maybe you're a little bit hesitant to go all in. Yeah, you know, there's a, depending on who you ask, there's a lot of, of – opinion about the preseason polls you know the houston folks don't seem to uh to think too much about it you know the group of five has has usually not gotten a lot of uh respect in the preseason polls but then you look at it there you know there was a voter in the coaches poll that gave texas a first place vote and they're not gave you know there was a voter who didn't rank baylor and they're in the top 10 so uh you know that's it's it's probably good for guys like you and me on talk shows or newspapers we can write and talk about it but I thought they probably were in that 17 to 21 range. But, you know, if you're in it, at least you have the opportunity to move up rather than it being, you know, week two or week three and you, you have to kind of climb your way in. At least there is some expectation. And, you know, we, we, like I said, we saw Cincinnati do what they did last year. And, you know, Houston doesn't have a lot of big games on the schedule, so they're going to have to – to impress some people with some wins and and get some help along the way. Joseph, we had somebody ask a question about this on the text line. It made me want to ask you, even though it's not about this year, which of the remaining Big 12 teams that Houston and the others are joining do you think will end up being the best rivalry for the Cougars? Because they they already played Texas Tech, obviously got a current thing going with Tech, so that could be it, yeah. Yeah, you know, but I th- I think a lot of people just base you know think about it. A couple of years ago during the pandemic, when Houston sent their uh, equipment truck up to uh, to Baylor and the game, <laughs> you know where I'm going with oh, this. Yeah. And, and then and then Holgerson gets on the uh, the tweet store. I I think that that eventually becomes the rivalry. You know, I I don't see the TCU moving into that spot that they kind of have with SMU and. Memphis right now. So, you know, I put my money on, on Baylor Houston sort of being that rivalry. I think it's going to be great in basketball. Mm-hmm. And then you look at the football aspect of it, but you know, they want to play Baylor that, you know, the whole thing that happened a couple of years ago, you know, there's just a lot of storylines and I, and I just think it'd be a good in-state rivalry. I don't think it's with uh, uh, Central Florida or anybody like that, or even Cincinnati. Some people were saying, what about BYU and the Cougars versus Cougars? You know, BYU so far out there that you know i think that that's going to be a weird dynamic but uh i I would put put you know my money on baylor houston being the the rivalry at least on houston side yeah that was a very not so subtle jab uh, at, at the bus was there they're ready to go and believe it we were i think we were because we were just wanting to cover a damn football game joseph we were kind of as disappointed as maybe dana and houston were yeah, and you know, uh, we know Mac Rhodes and from his time at Houston, and, and I'm sure between Dave Aranda and Mac Rhodes, they, and if they could have played that game, they would have. And, and we all know what the COVID numbers were in that game and what, what positions they were down and stuff. But 
I, I, I guess they just sent the truck early. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it, it's, it's only three hours away. So, you know, I, I get that part, but it's not like they sent it to, uh, to, uh, Los Angeles or, or, uh, Eugene, Oregon or somewhere. So it, it, it made for some nice early, you know, break the monotony of the, the, the pandemic. So a little, you know, a little storyline, but, but I, but I think that that's certainly a, a game, especially, you know, with Baylor playing so well and, 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 and being the preseason favorites this year, I think that carries over. And if that happens, you know, that could really be a good game, you know, for the first, first year of the new Big 12. Yeah, and uh, man, what a coaching combo, Aranda and Holgerson. I mean, that's that's like the two totally different guys. But, you know, one's an offensive genius, one's a defensive genius, different personalities. But I, you know, obviously history. I think that would be fascinating, uh, a fascinating aspect as well. So yeah, Baylor Houston would be great. I mean, before we, I mean, well, as long as we're talking about the future, Joseph, how do we ensure? That before all is said and done, the Texas Longhorns are playing a game down in Houston and not at NRG. Is is that much of a talk down there? You you know, uh, there, there's so many conspiracy theories out there that some people think that at some point the Longhorns will find a way into the the scheduling room where they're talking and write a big check just to avoid not having to play in Houston. But uh, you know, for right now. If, if things hold up, you know they're going to get at least one trip to Houston, and Houston would go to Austin. Now I don't, I don't think that they'll be here the, the duration. I think it's maybe the one year and out. Uh, but you know that's that's something that's been a long time uh, coming. You know when when they lost uh, Tom Herman to Texas, they actually asked Texas in, in lieu of paying them the buyout if they would schedule a home football game. Uh, for Houston and, and a basketball series and, and Texas declined. So, uh, you know, they haven't played in, you know, I believe it's 20 years in football. And then they played in a postseason basketball tournament, you know, back maybe eight or nine years ago. So, uh, yeah, a lot of people would want that game to happen. And, uh, the AD for Houston a couple of months ago when we asked him said, look, I'll believe it when I see it. So, uh, uh, we'll just have to wait and see what the schedule. I'm thinking more interesting. I think they're going to send Dana Hogerson to Morgantown yeah. uh, for that first game. <laughs> so, you know, so, you, so you know how that stuff plays out. But, you know, can you imagine Hogerson back in Austin if it's this year or next year and, you know, the horns down, all the stuff that mm-hmm. he did at, uh, in that last – when they beat Texas. Uh, uh, yeah, there's a lot of things with the familiarity of coaches and, and schools that uh, I'm looking forward to. It. I think the new Big 12 uh, is, is going to be fun for a lot of people and there's gonna be a lot of uh, i think it's gonna be a lot even you know moving forward uh, and you have clayton too in the quarterback who's fantastic award winning from a year ago obviously a part of a lot of the watch list earlier uh this summer your thoughts about does it all just uh, he not that he carries that team on his shoulders but in a lot of ways he is a stud for them and what he does will make a big difference in how good they are yeah th- this guy uh, it's the road that he's taken to get here you know, he was the backup for De'Aaron King uh, the first year. King gets hurt. He has to burn his red shirt and play in a, a bowl, meaningless bowl game. He gets sacked ten times. And then the, the next year, De'Aaron King decides to red shirt. So, Vaden Toon comes in and plays the rest of that season. And then, you know, when he leaves here, he'll have about 50 career starts, which is just crazy uh, given, you know, the extra year he got with COVID. But he has developed, you know, last year got hurt with a hammy. And it just made him more of a pocket passer. He was able to just sort of get out of the mode of having to run for everything. And he, he became a quarterback. And then this season, they've loaded him up, added a bunch of new uh, playmakers in the offense. So, yeah, this is a guy that, you know, if you would have asked me several years ago if, if he was going to be the quarterback in, you know, for the remainder, you know, I might have had my doubts. But he's, he's gone to a quarterback that now this summer did well with the Manning Passing Academy, won their – their competition there and is being talked about, you know, as a, as a legitimate uh, NFL draft pick, possibly a second day guy. So you're right. A lot's riding on, on him, but he's certainly not there to have to do it alone, but, but he, uh, he's more than capable of carrying a, a, what should be at a really explosive offense this year. It seems like he's one of those guys that I think people are going to turn on the TV who have watched enough Houston and be like, he's still there. He was like Kendall Brow's first recruit, uh, first major <laughs> recruit, right? Well, he, yeah, yeah, he was part of the Major Applewhite uh, yeah. team. And once they let uh, Major go, you know, and it, that's a credit to, to him and to Holgerson because, you know, he was not Holgerson's hand-picked quarterback 
and and sometimes they they tend to look elsewhere and they uh they they went with Toon and he he proved them that that was the right move so uh certainly uh if you, I was looking up some stats on him he's he's on the verge of being a 10,000 yard passer which uh, is amazing because he hasn't had a lot of big passing games that you would think that like come with that like a Case Keenum back in the day uh so uh when his set, when his career is all said and done he has a chance you know to finish in the top 5 and a lot of categories at a school that's known to pass the ball. So, uh, you know, good for him. I mean, he's had he's had a much better career than than as than it started for sure. Joseph, we have Houston fans who are a part of our chat room who watch or listen to us, and a lot of them excited we have you on today. So that's good, and it's great to have you back on the show. One question was, and, and it's just about a singular player: the young man transferred from USC, Man Jack the Fourth, the wide receiver. Uh, I, I, I'm. I don't want to put you on the spot, but your thoughts about him? Well, they're real high on him. I mean, this is a, a big kid. I believe he's six two, one ninety five, somewhere around there. Uh, he he he's slotted at, at, at the outside receiver spot, but they also feel like they can play him inside. And you know, I, I tweeted out that yesterday, and somebody responded. He he's a man jack of all trades. Yeah. Uh, so I mean, he he's a guy that figures in really big in this offense. He's he along with Sam Brown. Uh, from West Virginia, they went out and got uh, Cody Jackson uh, from Oklahoma, uh, and they, they, you know, they just added a bunch of receivers. And, and granted, these are guys that didn't play a lot at their old schools, but they were highly recruited out of high school. Most of them are local guys. Uh, Man Jack is a tomball guy right down the, you know, in the suburbs here. So, I mean, you know, great question about him because I would not be surprised if he's he's their version this year of like a. You know, a Jake Herslow, and, and for you guys who may not know him, he ended up being one of their top receivers down the stretch. He was a uh, Old Dominion transfer, and uh, he just lit it up late in the year so that they didn't have to rely on their their main guy, Nathaniel Dale. So I would expect uh, Joseph Manjack, the fourth, to uh, to figure uh, you know become one of those you know main targets for Clayton Toon early in the year. One of the favorite players I've ever covered in high school, and there's a bunch, but he is one of my favorite. He was injured last year. James Fulbright the third, who walked on at Houston. Uh, I know he had a, a bad – he was in the hospital for uh, quite some time and and was injured. Uh, what is his status? Well, uh, he's back, and, and you're right. It was a uh, late-in-camp in uh, injury that he suffered, leg injury. Uh, but, he, you know, he's a human bowling ball. I mean, oh, he yeah. goes in the limited time. And, you know, you look at his numbers in high school, you know, amazing. And, and I remember when he got here, you know, he told us that a lot of a lot of the reason, you know, his size, you know, he's not a real big guy. But uh, but he ended up doing, I believe it was like a preferred walk-on status at Houston. And he got in some games. And he was averaging, a, I think, over 10 yards a carry. But he is in camp. Uh, one of the uh, – actually, Holgerson told us yesterday that he's Mr. Reliable. I mean, he's a guy that, that they're counting on. And the way that the backfield shapes up, they lost Alton McCaskill, who was their star, you know, rookie of the year in the the American, to uh, to an ACL. So uh, a former Texas Tech guy, Tayshawn Henry, is going to be the number one back. It looks like Brandon Campbell, who played at USC, is the number two. And then behind that, uh, James Fulbright is, is in the mix for that, you know, to get some carries. It's certainly a lot more than he did – you know, in his previous couple of years. I'm glad you mentioned McCaskill. I was going to bring him up, uh, knowing, knowing that he's injured. But, man, just what a heck of a player, Joseph. I, I, I'm i glad they've got, you know, reinforcements. But I was really excited to see him play this year. How's he doing in his recovery? You know, he, he's been clear to, to start running. And, you know, that sort of raised some eyebrows because the guy, you know, the guy had the injury in early April. Yeah. And, you know, there was, there was really – you know, there was no chance. You know, with these ACLs, though, you know, people have been coming back a lot sooner. They're, they're not going to risk it. They're not going to try to rush him back. You know, the next time we see him is, you know, in the, in the, the Big 12 debut season next year. But, uh, they, you know, that is a blow. I mean, he's a guy that just came in and became their workhorse, their everyday back. Uh, you know, 16 touchdowns, nearly 1,000 yards. But he was also a, a guy that they could throw to out of the backfield. So, uh, you know, having Tayshawn Henry helps and then, they went out and got some extra guys uh, in the uh, in the portal, or at least one guy in the portal. Uh, but yeah, I don't expect to see any anything out of uh, Alton McCaskill this year, and then just kind of get him healthy, get him at that point. It'll be about 16 months post surgery, and he you know, hopefully he's good to go for the 2023 season. It, UTSA lost some key people. Uh, Jeff Trailer, you know the story. We know the story. We know him personally with what he's done down there. Is that one that they cannot in any way, shape, or form overlook? 
Oh, absolutely. And, you know, if, if Houston needs a reminder, you know, they opened up the, the football stadium here in 2014. And uh, my son was born two days before that, so I didn't cover that game. And thankfully I didn't because Houston lost to UTSA in the debut of their, their new brand-new football stadium. So, uh, you know, that's, that's been a sore spot for years. Uh, of, of what happened in that game. And, you know, that was the year I believe they were still transitioning uh, to, to their full-time Division One. So, yeah, they're, they're, I guarantee you that, that Houston's not overlooking that. You know, I, what Trailer's done and the other, you know, coaches before him at UTSA has just been phenomenal. And, and of course, you know, they, they've got some holes to fill, especially in the backfield. Uh, but, you know, this is a dangerous team, and it's on the road, and they'll be hyped up. Mm-hmm. And, there's not a lot of film. You know, when you go in, there's some film of the previous year, but how much changes are made. So that's certainly – I think that's probably more of a trap game for Houston than, than the following week against Lubbock. I mean, against Texas Tech and Lubbock. But you have to sort of – you got to get past that first landmine to get to the next one. So uh, Houston's going to have to be, uh, you know, on their toes that entire, uh, you know, couple of weeks of the season. Yeah, I mean, those first two weeks, I mean, once you get past those, if they get past those successfully, then, you know, look out. I mean, that's those first two weeks are really the the kind of, uh, well, you know, they're going to dictate everything, basically. It's kind of the path that they're on. So we'll know a lot right out of the, the gates. Uh, Joseph, before we let you go, is there anything in particular, perhaps a storyline or player uh, that we have not touched on that you feel is going to be uh, of importance this year worth mentioning? You know, a lot of focus is on the group they call Stack Avenue, their defensive line. And they've lost some pieces for the last couple of years. Peyton Turner, Logan Hall, who's from oh, down yeah. the road, and uh, for you guys. So you know they're they're gonna have to plug some holes. But they just they're so deep at that position that they're comfortable and confident that they can you know overcome those losses. I would look at Derek Parrish at one of the edge rusher positions. Uh, DeAnthony Jones is another. Uh, he's the sack leader last year, and and then uh, they have one other guy, uh, Nelson Caesar. So. Uh, in fact, I'm writing that for tomorrow, just, just looking at their pass rushing situation and how the entire D line, you know, what those pieces are. So it'll be interesting. That's where it all started for them last year. That's sort of where they get their, their mojo. And, you know, they, they've got a lot of guys to run out there. So that, that could be a really key part of this season, just like it was last year. Joseph, thank you very much. It's almost here. Evidence, stats, players, all that. We'll find wins and losses. Thanks for your time. Hope to get you on again. Hey, any time for my Central Texas folks. Hey, yeah, Thanks you too. Time. That's uh, Joseph Duarte, Houston hey. Chronicle and the University of Houston. Yeah, I think uh, that those first couple weeks, I mean, 